I want to say welcome to the virtual uh, BSR weekly lecture. As many of you will know, my name is Harriet O'Neill and I'm assistant director here and in Rome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Nigel Pollard. Um, Nigel is an associate professor in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Swansea University. He's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London and a former research fellow um, between 1996 and 1997 here at the British School at Rome. So welcome back, Nigel. Um, he is also an advisor to the recently established UK Military Cultural Protection Pro Cultural Property Protection Unit and a board member of UK Blue Shield, which is the UK national element of International Blue Shield. So I'm sure he'll be um, able to answer your questions on this as well. Dr Pollard initially trained, as some of you will know, as a Roman archaeologist and historian, but his research now focuses on the successes and failures of cultural property protection in the Second World War including, and you'll hear more about this, the Allied Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Monuments men, one of whom was our previous BSR director, John Ward Perkins, and there's some photographs of him in the um, slide presentation, and their value as lessons for contemporary policy and practice. His recent publications include Bombing Pompeii, World Heritage and Military Necessity, 2020, in which he examines the 1943 bomb damage at Pompeii in its wider context, including the evolution of allied cultural property protection. So I can see Chris Wickham, our director, has also joined us as well. So welcome, Chris. Um, we uh, might... uh, uh, hi, Nigel. Long time no see. <laughs> hi, Chris. Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. So it's brilliant. So we can be doing a, a Q&A together. Um, so I should just like to say um, before we hand over to you, Nigel, um, that uh, all of our online audience are reminded that it's been recorded and that you can send you in your Q&A, but please do that using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you can send the questions in um, during the talk or afterwards, and we'll do our best to get through all of them. So I shall say, um, over to you really, Nigel, with your talk, which is, even the Germans did not do that, the British military requisition and occupation of the Musea Nazionale di Napoli, and between December 1943 to June 1944. So thank you very much. Thanks. Right, I'm just gonna share my screen now. Okay, and I'm gonna become the BSR logo. <laughs> Right, okay. Um, before I start the, the paper proper, uh, I want to say a bit about the historical connection between the BSR and the protection of heritage in conflict zones uh, for those of you who don't know about it already. Uh, John Ward Perkins, who was director of the BSR, of course, from 1945 to 1974, had previously been a key figure in the development of allied heritage protection activities in the Second World War. Ward Perkins had worked with the well-known archeologist Mortimer Wheeler before the war. And in early 1943, Ward Perkins was an officer serving in North Africa in a Royal Artillery Regiment commanded by Wheeler. Concerned at the prospect of damage that might be done to archeological sites in Tripolitania by occupying British forces, uh, Wheeler and Ward Perkins on their own initiative took some measures to mitigate such damage. Uh, at the end of 1943, Major Ward Perkins was transferred to the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Subcommission, the MFAA, uh, in Italy, a small and specialised component of Allied military government that focused on issues of heritage protection, uh, and he ended the war as its director in, in Italy. This was the, the Italian element of the uh, the monuments men of the um, uh, of the film that some of you may have seen. Um, so this historic photograph from the BSR archive here uh, shows John Ward Perkins on on the right wearing the shorts uh, at the very end of the war in Europe at a, a place called Campo Torres near the Italian Austrian border. Uh, this was the location of a cache of art from Florentine collections that had been moved by German forces from its refuges outside Florence in 1944. When MFAA officers arrived, they found not only the cache of art, but also their counterparts in the German Kunstschutz organization there too, 
uh, including its director in Italy, Colonel Alexander Langsdorff, the, the tall guy uh, in the uh, closest to Ward Perkins, just off to the right of the center of the picture. Uh, the, the smaller man here in the civilian suit on the left-hand side of the image uh, is Filippo Rossi, the superintendent of galleries for Florence at that time, who'd come to arrange the transfer of the, the art cash back to uh, Florence. As a result of Ward Perkins' connection with the M MFAA, the BSR archive now includes not only a large number of the photographs that were taken, by the MFAA to document war damage to heritage sites in Italy, many of which are now available uh, online, but also documents of what we might term cultural intelligence, lists and maps of cultural sites prepared for military use, uh, mostly prepared by US civilian academics, uh, as well as reports and correspondence relating to MFAA uh, activity. Here are a few examples of photographs and um, inventories of cultural sites um, and, and um, some documents. Uh, here's some recent news from the, the archive. Um, in 1944, early 1944, Headquarters Mediterranean Allied Air Forces compiled a collection of aerial photographs of Italian towns with cultural sites marked on them uh, and keyed to typescript lists identifying those monuments uh, for use in planning air operations with the hope, often not realized, of minimizing or preventing damage to those sites. Here's one example of, of um, one page of that particular um, book uh, entitled Ancient Monuments of Italy. That doesn't only cover ancient monuments, uh, aerial photographs. So this is the page for Cremona, uh, you can see uh, cultural sites marked and numbered with arrows, uh, and then you've got the corresponding section of the, the typescript identifying those particular uh, monuments there. Um, the only other, uh, the, this is very rare, the only co other copy I'm aware of is, is in the, the uh, UK National Archives in Kew, and that's the copy I used for uh, for my book. It, I mean, it, it's, it, these are photographic prints stuck to paper pages and typescript. This is not a, a formal book in any solid sense. Um, now, uh, as many of you know, John Ward Perkins' son, Brian, uh, is a very distinguished archaeologist in his own right. And we were corresponding recently um, about some stuff in my book. Uh, and he mentioned that as a boy in the BSR, he'd always been both fascinated and appalled uh, by a book on the BSR library shelves with RAF photographs of Italian cities with prime monuments circled for the bombers to avoid if possible. And that was the ancient monuments of Italy, this, this um, volume that had been prepared by Mediterranean Allied Air Forces. Um, I never knew it was there. I'd never seen it there. Um, but it's now been tracked down. Alessandra Jovenko knew where it was. Um, it's no longer on the library shelves. It, 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 it's in the archive now. It's a, a, a rare piece of primary evidence. Uh, it was donated not by John Ward Perkins, but by a, another BSR related Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives officer, uh, John Bradford, who was a wartime army officer had interpreted aerial photographs for their military intelligence value. And of course, as many of you know, after the war exploited those uh, same photographs for their archeological uh, value as well. So this was given to the BSR library by, uh, by John Bradford. Um, and we've got it now, uh, as I said, I only, I only know of one other copy uh, anywhere, the one in queue, there might be others around. I'd be interested to hear if there are. Um, so that's some background. That's the, the BSR and, and cultural property protection uh, and armed forces and, and conflict zones and things like that. Um, now to the, the paper proper, uh, which doesn't actually have much of a direct connection with, with John Ward Perkins. Uh, he joined the MFAA at about the time all this stuff was taking place. So he's sort of there in the background and tangentially involved with some of the details, but he's not a primary uh, 
uh, figure in this paper. So, um, the Museo Nazionale di Napoli, described in wartime Allied military documentation as the most important museum of classical antiquities in the world, was requisitioned, requisitioned and occupied as a British Army medical stores depot from December 1943 to June 1944, over the objections of Allied Monuments officers, MFAA officers that is, and over the objections of a military commission of inquiry. Uh, in my recent book, Bombing Pompeii, I characterized that occupation as a failure of Allied cultural property protection, an example of what Eisenhower described as military convenience masquerading as military necessity. While I still think that is broadly speaking true, I also want to play devil's advocate a bit today uh, and suggest that in some respects, the occupation can be viewed as a success for military cultural property protection. Uh, but first I wanna set the occupation in the context of the museum's wider wartime experiences. Some of you may be familiar with this background already, uh, it's been discussed by other scholars, but it's worth repeating as it illustrates some important general issues relating to museums uh, in wartime. So, the Naples Museum contained, of course, material from Pompeii and Herculaneum, uh, but also, for example, the Farnese collection of sculpture from Rome. Uh, at that time, it also housed the city's most important collection of paintings, uh, which are now in the Museo di Capodimonte. Uh, like other museums at the outbreak of the Second World War, it was essentially faced with two alternatives, to evacuate its collections or to protect them in situ, or a combination of the two. Italian state policy at the time was to devolve to regional fine arts and antiquities uh, authorities decisions on how to implement those strategies. Uh, the responsible authorities in the case of the National Museum of Naples were Superintendents uh, Amadea Maiuri for antiquities and Bruno Molaioli for fine arts. Um, about half to three quarters of the collections remained in the museum uh, throughout the war, uh, much of it very well protected. Uh, and you can see here, the, these are some 1942 photographs of the interior uh, of the Naples Museum, showing particularly large works of sculpture protected by sandbags and wooden scaffolding. Uh, these are pictures from the 1942 Italian propaganda volume, uh, La Protezione del Patrimonio Artistico. Very substantial um, photographs and uh, very uh, protection. And these are advertised very prominently um, in contemporary uh, Italian circles. Maiuri and Molaioli oversaw packing and transfer of part of the collection to refuges outside of the city. So it got a mixture of in-situ protection uh, and evacuation uh, of collections. And the refuges outside of Naples were often themselves buildings of historic and religious importance. Thus items from the National Museum and elsewhere in Naples were dispersed to sites that included the Loreto Abbey at Mercoliano um, shown here from one of the BSR's archival uh, photographs. You can see the, the crated up paintings leaning across against the wall there with a, a schoolboy in there for, um, for scale. Um, another refuge was located at the, the Holy Trinity Abbey at Carva de Terene on the way down to Salerno. Uh, and, and in particular, the, 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 the most important refuge for the collections from the National Museum was the Benedictine Abbey uh, at Monte Cassino. The main rationale for evacuation of collections was protection from bombing of urban sites, so moving things out of Naples uh, because Naples was being bombed. And um, so moving collections to refuges that were unlikely to be bombed in their own right for strategic reasons that weren't urban, lay outside cities, made sense. In the case, case of the National Museum in Naples, uh, the evacuation 
um, the the institute protection began as soon as war was declared, it, as soon as Italy became involved in, in the war. Uh, but the evacuation didn't actually take place until June 1943, only started in June 1943. And the final stage only came in September 1943 in direct response to the Allied landings in, in mainland Italy, when Naples had actually already suffered a great deal from bombing. Um, the evacuated materials at that time included precious items from the archaeological collections, uh, ancient sculpture, particularly bronze sculpture uh, and paintings. Uh, initially, the evacuation was supposed to include uh, marble sculpture, including the huge Farnese Hercules and the even bigger but very fragmentary Farnese bull. Um, Mayuri argued against this on the grounds of practicality. If you know those pieces, you'll know how difficult it would have been to uh, evacuate those. Uh, and eventually packed up and moved um, only the bronzes of the sculpture, including famous and important pieces excavated uh, from the villa of the papyri uh, at Herculaneum. We'll see one of those again in a moment. So in situ protection and evacuation, both together. In some circumstances, evacuation can be as risky as in situ uh, protection, so as, in, as risky as leaving things in place. Um, the choice of refuges that were used for, for Naples and some other parts of Italy as well, didn't really allow for the possibility that they, the refugees, might get caught up in combat on the ground or in tactical bombing related to ground combat. And of course, Monte Cassino Abbey lay in the front line itself by no, early 1944 out of the frying pan into the fire, uh, as it was. Had they remained there, the Naples Museum collections uh, in the refuge of Monte Cassino might well have been destroyed by Allied bombing, along with the Abbey itself in February 1944, uh, of course. However, by then, the Naples Museum collections had again been evacuated. Initially, they were moved by German military authorities to their headquarters at Spoleto, and then in December 1943 and January 1944, uh, they were moved to Rome. And here you've got a, a uh, Bundes archive, archival photograph showing uh, German troops unloading cases of, of, um, uh, of works of art moved from Monte Cassino, um, unloading them outside the, the Palazzo Venezia. Uh, but this second movement also highlighted another of the general risks of evacuation the potential for theft and misappropriation in the course of evacuations. So not all of the Naples material moved from Monte Cassino reached Rome. Um, 15 cases of it, including the Herculaneum bronze deer shown here, uh, and Titian's Danae uh, also shown here, uh, were misappropriated by the German Air Force Division Hermann Göring, reportedly as a birthday present for their patron. Uh, they seem to have reached Göring's residence at Karin Hall near Berlin in early 1944, his birthday was the 12th of January, uh, but he allegedly refused to receive them. Uh, eventually, in March 1945, they ended up in the salt mine art refuge at Alt Aussee uh, in Austria, to be discovered by US troops there at the end of the war, moved to the Allied central collecting point for looted art at Munich, and subsequently returned uh, to Naples. In contrast, the collections that remained in the National Museum itself survived more or less unscathed through to the liberation of Naples on the 1st of October 1943 despite some fighting around the museum between partisans and German troops during the Quattro Giornate of resistance uh, to the German uh, evacuation. By early October, Amadeo Maiuri, who was recuperating from a wound sustained in mid-September by an allied uh, air attack as he was trying to cycle from Pompeii to Naples. Uh, he was, was hit in the leg by a bullet uh, near Torre de del Greco. Uh, by this time, uh, Mayuri was, was actually living in the museum, was lodging in the museum, 
and, and there gave interviews to American journalists who entered with the, the Allied troops and sort of visions of Mayuri holding forth to these American journalists. And Mayuri was quite well known outside of Italy, even at this time because of his association uh, with Pompeii. Um, the correspondent subsequent stories emphasized the effectiveness of the in situ protection in the museum while reporting the severe bomb damage which had been inflicted on other historic buildings in the city like the church of Santa Chiara. However, while these works in the, the Naples Museum were quite well preserved, the early days of the Allied occupation were marked by a series of both official requisitions and unofficial occupations of cultural institutions and heritage sites by Allied troops, in some cases leading to damage uh, and theft. However, the requisition and occupation of the Na uh, National Museum uh, began only in December 1943, so a couple of, of months after the, uh, uh, the, the Allied liberation uh, of Naples. It's very well documented in a series of Allied documents, including contemporary reports by US Monuments and Fine Arts Officer uh, and Peacetime Museum Director, Major Paul Gardner, by the proceedings of a subsequent Allied Military Commission of Inquiry, um, looking into things that went wrong when it came to cultural property protection uh, in Naples, the so-called Collier Commission, uh, and also by Italian sources, particularly the wartime memoir uh, of the director Amadeo Maiuri. Um, so what happened was um, on his arrival in Naples in the third week of, of October, Major Gardner, who was the assigned MFAA officer uh, to Naples, visited the museum, reported on its condition, and to quote, strongly recommended that it not be requisitioned. Nevertheless, on the 17th of November 1943, the Italian authorities were given notice of its intended requisition, the intention being to establish there a British army depot for medical supplies with 30 to 40 Royal Army Medical Corps personnel. Gardner protested strongly, but without success, and Lieutenant Colonel Sir Leonard Woolley, the famous archaeologist and at this time archaeological advisor to the British War Office, was equally unsuccessful in getting the requisition lifted when he visited Naples at the beginning of December. However, there was a series of meetings at this time between Gardner, Woolley, Mayuri, and an officer of the Royal Army Medical Corps, and also the British Brigadier Bruxner Randall, commander of the British base formation stationed throughout Naples. And these bore at least some fruit as we'll see later. But despite all of this, the occupation of the museum as the medical depot went ahead later in December, and in fact continued from December 1943 through to June 1944, despite the January 1944 recommendation of the Allied Collier Commission uh, that the museum be derequisitioned. So the occupation of historic buildings in Naples by Allied military forces frequently had been undertaken with claims of military necessity to the point where senior British civil affairs officer, Maurice Lush, who's quoted on the slide, slide, slide here, uh, characterized such claims as, as invariable pretexts rather than genuine claims of, of military necessity. However, in the case of the medical depot, the claim was not to be dismissed lightly. The number of sick and wounded allied personnel had grown significantly as the front had bogged down below Monte Cassino and there had been problems establishing adequate medical facilities for them and in supplying those facilities as well. A large and relatively undamaged building in Naples was needed for this. And as even Sir Leonard Woolley, who opposed the occupation, admitted, the National Museum was one of a very few of the required size in undamaged condition with convenient open areas for movement and storage of supplies. 
So what were the arguments against the requisition of and, and occupation of the museum? Um, first of all, there are the, the, the general moral and philosophical uh, arguments expressed here uh, by Paul Gardner. Um, but it, it, in a more detailed and pragmatic sense, perhaps, uh, occupation of the museum convened, uh, contravened rather, or potentially contravened, the provisions relating to belligerent occupation of, of cultural institutions and historic buildings given in the 1907 Hague Convention, which was the, uh, the, the body of international law uh, that still applied during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, the 1907 Hague Convention, these provisions of it uh, were quoted both in the British, contemporary British Manual of Military Law and in its US equivalent uh, rules of land warfare, um, which indicates that the, the property of uh, municipalities and historic buildings and things like that, um, their seizure, destruction or willful damage to them um, was forbidden uh, under 1907 Hague Convention um, and should be made the, the provision of, of legal proceedings. Um, I say that the, the, the occupation of the museum potentially contravened the 1907 Hague Convention because it isn't entirely clear cut. First of all, Italy's co-belligerent status raises the question of whether the laws of armed conflict uh, applied in this instance. Uh, the subsequent allied Collier Commission certainly felt that, that they did. The other question is whether temporary occupation of a building with the intention of returning it constitutes seizure uh, in the legal sense intended in, in the convention. The Collier Commission in this case actually focused on issues of damage rather than occupation per se, so they didn't touch on uh, that issue uh, at all. Uh, regardless of, of the occupation's relationship to the 1907 Hague Convention, it also contravened a number of allied administrative instructions for the treatment of historic buildings incorporated in the civil affairs planning for the occupation of Sicily and then of, of Italy, uh, mainland Italy. Uh, and the National Museum of, in Naples in particular was actually singled out in the British Civil Affairs Zone Handbook for Campania as one of the 21 sites uh, in Naples that was to be accorded special protection uh, from military use. Uh, there were a total of 46 of such sites in that list for Campania uh, alone. 21 of them were in Naples. The National Museum uh, was one of those sites that was supposed to be uh, protected and, and uh, secured, but not occupied, not subjected to military use. So those are some arguments, legal arguments, for example, against the occupation. Um, another reason not to occupy the museum was concern about public opinion, both in Italy and the uh, allied home countries, and potential negative political consequences, both political unrest in, in Naples, potentially, and elsewhere in Italy. Uh, but also the displeasure of politically important individuals at home, uh, including President Roosevelt, who had a special interest in, in um, protection of, of cultural heritage uh, in Europe. Um, Erskine Hume, the US Chief of Allied Military Government Fifth Army, in a discussion of damage to the Royal Palace of Naples rather than the, the museum, um, uh, the, the damage, to the, the occupation and damage to the Royal Palace took place at about the same time. Uh, Hume noted um, adverse Neapolitan public opinion, which claimed even the Germans did not do that. That's the, the title of, of my paper. And Sir Leonard Woolley, in his report on the requisition, also noted that Italian public opinion was an issue and the occupation of the museum might lead to unrest. Uh, Woolley also alluded to concerns about damage to cultural property voiced in the British Parliament, uh, as well as President Roosevelt's interest uh, in this particular uh, issue. There was also a range of detailed practical arguments against the occupation, many of them uh, actually voiced by Mayuri in the evidence that he gave to the subsequent uh, military mission of, of um, uh, commission of inquiry. Uh, first of all, 
un undeniably military use of a historic building made it liable to attack by the enemy under the 1907 Hague Convention. So the Germans could legitimately have attacked a military, uh, British military medical depot uh, in, based in the museum and so damaged the museum if they had the desire and means to do so ac accurately, which admittedly was unlikely, but it was a theoretical uh, possibility. Probably more significantly, uh, flammable stores that were going that were part of the military depot and plans to establish a field kitchen in one of the museum's courtyards increase the risk of fire and so of damage to or destruction of the collections. Um, the military occupation of the museum would also prevent Mayuri's staff from checking collections for damage, deterioration and theft and from carrying out necessary regular conservation work uh, on pieces within the museum. The large open areas of the museum floors with relatively few lockable doors made it difficult to close off particular areas for security. And this meant that soldiers, especially those in the building overnight or civilian laborers hired by the British might potentially steal from the collections uh, to which they might have relatively easy access because they couldn't be secured uh, properly. Uh, with rela in, in relation to that, um, Woolley noted when he visited the museum that while many of the sculptures, as we've seen, were, were sandbagged and effectively uh, protected from theft as well as from, the, from previous bomb damage, uh, other items within the museum were uh, partially or wholly exposed to damage or theft. So, for example, the majority of, of Pompeii and wall paintings that were not actually mounted on the walls of the museum had been stacked up without covers in one gallery, which was readily accessible to individuals within the uh, using other parts of the museum, but so potentially to military personnel if they were uh, in occupation. Uh, that Greek and Etruscan pottery, for example, was stored in the basement that could relatively easily be accessed from uh, occupied parts of the museum. Um, so there was a, a, a range of practical issues uh, that made it undesirable to occupy the museum for military use. Um, this is a, a plan of the museum from a, a contemporary uh, guidebook, hasn't changed much of course uh, now. Um, you, as you can see, the, the, the central open courtyards of, of the museum and you've got a photograph of one of my own photographs of that uh, there as well. So these open courtyards, in one of them, the, the, the kitchen uh, to feed the, the British troops who were stationed in the museum was supposed to be uh, installed there. Uh, also the plan shows within the enclosed uh, part of the museum around the courtyards. Um, you know, if you know this museum, you'll know that the interior is largely composed of large, uh, open spaces um, that have sort of thresholds that run between the, them, but don't have lockable doors between them. Um, those large open spaces were good for uh, are good for displaying sculpture, for example. Uh, they were potentially good for moving around and storing crated medical supplies, but not so good for uh, security. So there were plenty of good reasons not to occupy the, the Naples Museum for military use. So that raises the question of why the arguments against the requisition were ultimately unsuccessful. Um, first of all, there were tensions and ill feeling between, on the one hand, the base units of allied military forces that were responsible for logistics and for finding and allocating facilities uh, for military use. Uh, the base elements were quite keen to occupy as many buildings as possible. Uh, they came into conflict with the civil affairs components of allied military government uh, at the time, who had a potentially conflicting remit. Um, the, the allied military, uh, the, the, the civil affairs component within allied military government included the monuments and fine arts officers who had established the regulations for protection of historic buildings uh, and cultural sites and also civil affairs components within the armed forces also were concerned with 
issues of military government and public opinion and things like that. So they were the ones who would have to bear the brunt if, if uh, of ill feeling towards the uh, occupations and requisitions that had been carried out by the base elements uh, within the armed forces. Um, so that, that tension's one factor. Uh, another factor was that monuments and fine arts personnel were, were thinly stretched and their duties had low priority. Uh, Paul Gardner, I mentioned, who was the officer assigned to Naples, didn't actually arrive in Naples until about three weeks after Allied forces had entered the, the, the town, by, by which point actually a lot of damage had already been done. Uh, Gardner had been sidetracked to general civil affairs officers. He'd actually been military governor of the island of Ischia for a while until he could be spared and sent to Naples, where he took up his specialist duties as monuments officer, went to the, the, the National Museum straight away and recommended against potential uh, requisition, but ultimately was ignored for that. Uh, the reason he was ignored and the reason monuments officers more generally were often ignored is that they were invariably outranked. Uh, they tended to be a relatively junior rank, captains and majors, uh, and so uh, they found it difficult to enforce the regulations uh, that um, uh, they had developed because they came into conflict with more senior uh, officers. Another factor here was that the officers of the base units uh, who were looking for buildings that they could requisition invariably claimed at least that they hadn't been informed of the regulations or received lists of protected monuments. Whether it was because this was true, and there's certainly plenty of evidence that the, the necessary lists were not readily available. There was a shortage of them, even amongst monuments officers. So they may have had a point, or whether it was because they pretended they didn't know about the regulations and they didn't know which buildings were supposed to be protected as a pretext in order or an excuse in order to go ahead and requisition anyway, is not entirely clear. And there's probably a mixture of both of those things um, going on there. Uh, finally, there was the perhaps not unreasonable view expressed by at least one senior British officer that the war had meant historic buildings and cultural institutions in Britain uh, were subject to requisition and occupation for military purposes. And so it was unreasonable to exempt such buildings uh, in Italy, even though actually the Allied armed forces had established regulations that said that that should, should be the case. Uh, there was a sort of sense that, that it was... was it wasn't right to exempt uh, historic buildings in, in Naples from this sort of thing when it was going on in Britain uh, anyway. Um, you know, all of those factors uh, perhaps e explain the initial requisition, uh, but not why the museum wasn't derequisitioned after the Collier Commission recommended that it be derequisitioned uh, in January. Actually, the requisition, as you heard, uh, an occupation continued from January through to uh, June. Uh, I, I suspect that the, the reason for um, the failure to derequisition in January was really down to uh, inertia and also the ongoing conflicts of interest between allied military uh, government elements, civil affairs elements and the, the base uh, units, uh, one side or the other. Anyway, for all of these reasons, in, in my book, I characterize the occupation of the Naples Museum uh, as an example of what Eisenhower in his, his famous letter on historic monuments to Allied commanders in the Mediterranean theater in December 1943, characterized as military convenience in opposition to genuine military necessity that perhaps sometimes did justify risk to cultural heritage. However, to be fair, as Leonard Woolley acknowledged, it was a delicate balance between the genuine military need to address the logistical issues relating to the treatment of allied wounded against local and international sensibilities about the protection uh, of cultural sites and cultural property. Um, ultimately, in Woolley's view, uh, the balance came out against occupation based on the ingeniously logical argument that had the museum not been available, another building would have had to have been found. Therefore, the museum obviously was not indispensable. 
uh, it seems a curiously uh, uh, logical and impractical uh, argument against it. But Woolley's views were ignored anyway. Uh, Woolley as a Lieutenant Colonel was outranked, for example, by Brigadier Bruxton Randall. Um, Certainly, the, 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 the National Museum of Naples was an exceptional case, even amongst the other museums and historic buildings of Naples. And it was singled out as an exceptional case uh, by um, in, in inventories and lists of cultural property in Naples, um, put together by allied uh, forces. But th those were largely uh, ignored. I, I think the, the, the museum deserved to be left alone. Um, it was a really, it was a genuinely special case, uh, but that didn't happen. However, and, and this is where I, I play devil's advocate a little bit, um, characterizing this episode as entirely a failure of military cultural property protection uh, overlooks some successes in the mitigation of potential damage from the occupation uh, of the museum. Uh, that really emerged from the, those meetings between Gardner and Mayuri and Woolley and Bruxner Randall and the Royal Army Medical Corps uh, back in early December before the occupation actually took place. Um, what we see really was negotiation between the museum authorities, particularly Mayuri on the one hand, and Bruxner Randall uh, as the representative of the uh, British representative of the uh, allied base uh, elements. Uh, we see these, these two um, parties essentially mediated by the monuments and fine arts representative Gardner and Woolley, and they managed to achieve significant uh, compromise as Mayuri himself admitted at the time. When the occupation did eventually take place, of the British unit installed in the museum, only the guards, uh, some guards were allowed to remain there in the building overnight. Uh, and the other men slept and cooked in an adjacent house provided by the museum. Uh, so that also meant that the field kitchen wasn't installed in the, in the museum itself. Um, the, the men lodged in a elsewhere, um, so people couldn't wander around the museum late at night. Uh, and take things there was less risk to fire from cooking uh, on the premises. Um, museum staff were allowed to check the collections in occupied areas and rooms were set aside for access by museum staff uh, for conservation. Um, so the original argument would be that the museum would be totally closed off to museum staff, but access was, was negotiated uh, the required access was negotiated there. Um, a subunit of specialist military firefighters with appropriate uh, equipment was attached to the depot. So if a fire did break out, it could be suppressed relatively quickly before it could do damage uh, to the, uh, the collections there. Um, only trusted museum employees were hired as staff, civilian staff by the, the British. Uh, and particular care was taken with the storage of, of medical supplies um, to avoid damage to knocking things with crates as, as things were moved in and out of particular rooms and, and so on. Um, having only trusted civilian employees in the building rather than um, people who were unknown to the museum authorities also improved the security situation. All of this meant that the occupation caused a minimum of damage to the museum and its collections. Uh, and also the British undertook repairs to the fabric of the building. So while ultimately the museum should not have been occupied, on some level at least it was a success and the compromises negotiated reflect what might be done with military cultural property protection specialists acting as mediators between other elements of the armed forces, uh, the base units in this case, uh, who wanted to go ahead and requisition everything in sight on the one hand, and on the other hand, local heritage stakeholders like Mayuri. So what are the, the, the lessons of, of all of this? Um, well, we saw some of the detailed tactical lessons to be learned from the, this historical case study in, in the last slide, the things about 
you know, fire precautions and um, not making sure that military personnel aren't allowed, can't wander around and potentially steal things um, if, um, if a historic building has to be occupied by military forces at all. Um, other lessons for securing heritage sites under military occupation derived from this Second World War experience have been discussed and, and analyzed in print by Laurie Rush, who advises the, uh, the US Army. Um, on a higher operational level, perhaps, so th there are a number of other lessons that come through from the experience of the, the National Museum in Naples. These include, first of all, the, the need to embed cultural property protection in military doctrine and training from the start, not just as a bolt-on afterthought, as was largely the case uh, in the Second World War. This was something that was really put together rather hastily uh, in the lead up to initially the invasion of, of Sicily uh, and very little was, was uh, information about it was disseminated. Troops, officers, commanders weren't educated uh, about the regulations that were actually uh, in place. Um, another lesson is the need to ensure that individuals uh, military personnel with specific cultural property protection training have got input into operational planning uh, and a sufficiently defined role and rank and authority to actually influence it. So you know, what, this, what the Allied occupation of Naples required was some input from the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives uh, subcommission um, it, into the planning of the occupation and uh, the, the monuments men were sidelined because they were a new organization at the time. At the time, their role wasn't clear. They didn't have an established role within uh, military doctrine. And even when they got there, they, as Paul Gardner was, they were liable to be sidetracked to other civil affairs duties and they were outranked as well. The, the importance of their role wasn't sufficiently defined at that point. That changed as the war went on, particularly with the, uh, the advertisement of the importance of, of cultural property protection by Eisenhower uh, and others. Um, another factor, that, another lesson that's shown up here is the need to ensure ready access to what we might term cultural property intelligence, the kind of thing that we saw in the BSR archive that was circulating in the Second World War, inventories of cultural sites, sites that were not to be occupied like the Naples Museum. Um, those things weren't always as widely available and disseminated and known uh, to commanders as, as they should have been. So that's an important um, lesson. Um, that's essentially it from me. Um, if you're interested in this topic, uh, here's some further reading. Um, lots of good stuff um, written by Italian scholars on this subject. Um, I can plug my own book as well, inevitably. Um, so thank you very much for listening.